and welcome to the first episode of That Dinosaur Guy. My name is Joshua and I am That Dinosaur Guy. In today's episode we will be looking at Ceratosaurus. Um, one of my personal favourites and I really like the paper model which is the model that I have here. He is a medium sized theropod from the late Jurassic period, about 161 million years ago. Uh, and even though I say medium, he's still in the region of about, I think, upper estimates, seven to eight meters long. Um, so, medium for theropods, but very large for anything we would ever encounter. Um, he is a member of the family Ceratosauria, and more specifically the clade Ceratosauridae. Now, Ceratosauria uh, gave rise later on to ablosaurs such as uh, Carnotaurus, um, Rajasaurus, Majungasaurus, those sort of Cretaceous carnivores. Uh, and you can begin to see the traits of ablosaurs present in, in the early Ceratosaurs. Um, now he gets his specific name, which is Ceratosauria nasocornis, from the nose and brow horns, um, which are wonderful in this model, I really like them. Now to the extent at which they would extend, we're not entirely sure, but any feature that would mark you out as a different species um, is likely to be favourable, and so it's not a bad reconstruction to have these features be, um, be quite large. Other identifying features of Ceratosaurus uh, include very long teeth, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, small arms, they're too large in the paper model, uh, but for our purposes they're described quite well. Um, you'll notice as well in this model that they're not pronated, which is a rarity <laughs> in some dinosaur models. Pronated being that they are not facing the ground, like you see in um, Jurassic Park Velociraptors, for instance. Um, no, they're not pronated, which is good. Um, other features include a row of osteoderms around, running around the back. Now this model has three either side of the main midline osteoderms. I'm not sure how accurate that is. Uh, I know that we have uh, skeletal casts that have this midline of osteoderms, so those uh, I'm assuming are quite accurate. Um, but I guess it's, it's not out of the realm of possibility to have uh, lesser rows as well. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mentioned teeth earlier, and yes, he's got very long teeth, especially the ones that attach to the maxillary bone. Um, they are like giant steak knives, serrated, and would be perfect for slicing off chunks of meat, as well as holding any prey that it would catch within its um, rather large gape. And to do with the gape, um, there is some suggestion that the lower jaw bones were not attached as firmly to the upper jaw bones as in other predators of its time, so potentially it could have even widened its gape a bit wider, um, like that of a snake, though not that extreme, I don't think. Um, that isn't for debate though, so that, that, that could, could change. Um, the creature had very good eyesight. It was a predator, it had large eyes, large orbits, uh, and the eyes would have a, a small degree of, of binocular vision, I believe, but it had a much wider jaw than something like an allosaur, so that would limit the amount of binocular vision it had, and it would have nowhere near the same binocular vision as something like a tyrannosaur, but uh, that's what being a highly evolved cerulosaur will get you. Um, it also had um, no orbital ring as far as I'm aware. I couldn't find examples of a skeleton with the orbital ring and that's that little ring of bone you sometimes find in, in fossils. Um, a really good example would be fossil ichthyosaurs. Do a Google search for them. You will often find a large ring of bone where the eye would be. And that is in generally indicative of animals that would have nocturnal habits uh, and we haven't found any for this guy so one would assume he would be mainly a daytime predator. Um, which brings me on to the model has dot pupils, which you probably can't see, but it has dot pupils rather than slit pupils. Um, and that would be, I guess, fairly accurate for, for a daytime predator like this. Um, the 
arms moving back, as I said, uh, too large in this model, they'll be quite small, I think about half as big in, in the actual creature. And the arms are really interesting because they have four fingers and that is quite a basal trait. Um, now, what do I mean by basal? Now basal means less specialised and derived means more specialised. It, it's a less misleading term than primitive and advanced because creatures don't necessarily get more or less advanced, they get more or less specialised depending on how long they've been around, um, which can lead to wonderful things like gigantism and dwarfism and, and highly specialised creatures um, that, that can't exist anywhere else. It's, it's a wonderful thing. So these arms and the fingers in particular are quite basal. Um, earliest archosaurs um, through the Permian and through the Triassic would have five fingers and five toes. You see finger and oh, digit reduction in general in theropods, um, with the most derived examples being three and four in, um, well, sorry, three and four, three and two. Three fingers in uh, the later Allosauroides and um, Spinosaurs and things like that. Two fingers obviously being famous amongst Tyrannosaurs. Um, these guys, as they led into things like Ablosaurs, the arms and would continue to reduce and eventually they would become essentially um, useless, potentially even absorbed within the flesh of the chest in creatures like Taurus. Um, not Taurosaurus, <laughs> in creatures like Carnotaurus, uh, too many names to remember. In creatures like Carnotaurus, those are, like I said, those arms would become incredibly reduced. Now, um, Ceratosaurs would still have some use for their arms, they weren't completely useless, and they would have probably retained some grasping ability, uh, though how much is up for debate. The legs are shortish but powerful. Uh, with a long foot. Um, now the thing about dinosaurs, um, as people may know, is they were digitigrade, which means they walked on their toes. Um, similar to a cat or a dog, if you've got a cat or a dog, look at how it walks, look at the structure of the foot, it's very fascinating. This entire section here is the foot, um, so it's not walking on its heel here, that is the heel there. So there and there, those are the heels, that is a pad underneath the foot, that would help support the animal's weight, but this entire section here, and on this side here, that is foot and toe, as opposed to us where we walk on our heels and we have the toes towards the end of the foot. Um, have a look Have a look at birds, if you see birds in your garden, um, with the surface that they walk on is their toes, and they have that funny little backwards pointed knee, that's actually their heel, and then the, the actual knee is, is further up the animal. Now that's where you get the drumstick. <laughs> Uh, so powerful legs um, and a, a very tall from the hip looking tail. I believe the tail's fairly accurate in terms of length in this uh, model, um, but if you look at the skeleton of Ceratosaurus compared to something like an Allosaurus that it shared its environment with, the bottom row of processes on the uh, vertebrae were thinner and bent slightly backwards. And this has actually led some people to think that it may have used its tail for um, aquatic needs, swimming potentially like a, a crocodilian. And it's not entirely out of their own possibility. Um, these guys were not the members of Tetanuria, which is animal uh, theropods that were later on that were more closely related to birds than they were to um, earlier theropods. And Tetanurians are marked by having interlocking vertebrae. Um, some of them even had ossified tendons, some dromaeosaurs had oss ossified tendons, which helped to stiffen the tail. Um, these guys didn't have those adaptations, so being having flexible tail was a possibility. Um, again, up for debate though. If I hear any news, I will be sure to let you know. So these guys potentially had some aquatic traits for capturing prey, for swimming, um, which obviously would be useful for niche partitioning, as these guys were in direct competition with Allosaurus and other Allosaurus forms, so having those adaptations would be useful for survival. On that note, that is pretty much all I know about 
Ceratosaurus. Um, thank you for listening to me talk about him for the last 10 minutes or so. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. I will aim to answer questions at the end of the next video. Um, if you have corrections, please also leave them in the comments. I am not an expert on dinosaurs. I am not a paleontologist. I'm just that dinosaur guy in the office who likes to talk about them a lot to anyone that will listen. And so leave corrections in there and I will gather them together and do a corrections video at a later date. So thank you for joining me. Please like, comment and subscribe if you enjoyed and I will see you next time.